Hello, everyone. I hope you are having a wonderful day. Welcome to the Addicted Mind Podcast. My name is Dwayne Osterlin. I'm your host, and we are on to another episode. I have a very interesting guest today, John Meyer, and we're going to talk about a topic that I really hadn't put a lot of thought into until I came across his work. And that is about looking at addiction as a disability versus looking at addiction as a disease and the implications that has for us on how we handle addiction in our society and when dealing with addiction. So John is a therapist and philosopher based in Cambridge. He holds a MSW in clinical social work from Simmons University and a PhD in philosophy from Princeton. He is a staff clinician at the Cedar Clinic and regularly teaches at Leslie University and currently is working on a book on the disability view of addiction. So I hope you enjoy this conversation, get a lot out of it, and it really makes you think about how we view addiction in our society. It was definitely thought provoking for me, so I hope it is the same for you. And don't forget, if you're getting a lot out of the Addictive Mind, click the subscribe button so you can get all the latest episodes in your feed and maybe even write us or leave us a review. That'd be awesome. All right, stay tuned for this episode. All right, everyone, welcome to the Addicted Mind. My guest today is John T. Meyer. And we're going to talk about what I think is a really interesting conversation. And I've been really looking forward to interviewing you, John. We're going to talk about language and looking at addiction as a disability versus the medical disease model and talk about that. But first, before we jump into that discussion, just Tell me a little bit about you and and also this journey even to want to talk about this or write about this because you've written a lot of papers on it and you have a book that you're working on about it. And so I want to dig into all of this stuff. But first, tell us a little bit about you and we'll start there. Definitely. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have this conversation too. So yeah, I have a somewhat atypical trajectory. So I'm currently a clinical social worker. I work at the Cedar Clinic in Brookline, Massachusetts. I mainly work with young adults who are at risk of psychosis in their families. So that's my primary work. I also teach psychology and philosophy at primarily at Leslie University in Cambridge. By training, I have a PhD in philosophy. So I have a PhD in philosophy from Princeton and worked primarily as an academic philosopher for about a decade at various universities here and abroad. And, and about five years ago, I kind of got pretty passionate about the issue of of mental health and went back and got my MSW and kind of retrained um, as a therapist. And so that's my primary work. So this work on addiction is in many ways at the intersection of those interests. It's a, it's a work of philosophy in some broad sense of philosophy, but it's basically about mental health, more specifically about a, a particular issue that I'm very passionate about, namely, namely the topic of addiction. So that's kind of my, my quick bio. Yeah, thank you. And and I would say if you're going to work in the mental health field, you're going to encounter addiction. I mean, it's such a it's such a huge issue with mental health that it's going to be it's going to show up everywhere, in my opinion, <laughs> almost everywhere when you're dealing with mental health issues. Uh, addiction is going to be a, a, a piece of that. So let's just jump into where you started to like really start to think about like this. This isn't fitting this this language that we have. So. First, I guess let's define that language that we, from the history, and then kind of go into this this change in thinking. Yeah, definitely, and it's an interesting way into it. So there are all these. So the language way. So there there is words that get used around addiction. A lot of them begin with DIS. There's disease. There's disorder. There's disability, and a lot of kind of well intentioned right. people have are kind of confused about which of these is the appropriate word to use in certain contexts. And I think these these language issues are really are really important. In a way, I guess what what like what I care about ultimately is like what sort of the people with addictions receive the treatment that they want and that their rights are respected and that they're, they're able to live, you know, their best lives. So like the, in a way, ultimately the issues about language are secondary to me, to the issues about kind okay. of like policy. But I think these debates are often about language and, and, and I think it's, it's, it's important to start there. So when I think that addiction is disability, I'm, I kind of making a claim about how we should talk about addiction, but I'm really, I'm making a claim about how we should act about addiction. In particular, disabilities are protected 
you know, under U.S. law, addiction is already a protected disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so it's really a claim ultimately about policy and about treatment, although I think the language piece is all, all, is also very important, too. So let's go back a, a little bit yeah. just for listeners, too, yeah. because when we look at addiction, from what I understand, and is that, you know, ad- addiction, in, in you know, way back in the 30s when AA came around was seen as just a moral issue. Yeah. Like it wasn't even discussed as a disease issue. It was just it was a moral failing. And if if you struggled with that, there was really no help for you because you were something was wrong with you with your morality, your personhood. Yes. Yes. And the so so as you say, stepping back a bit, so there's been a movement in the 20th century. AA has been in many ways in the vanguard of this, but lots of other organizations and individuals inside and outside of AA have have advocated for this sort of view of understanding addiction. A, I mean, I guess to pick up your Somehow, so there was this initial thought that addiction is somehow a, a moral issue, and insofar as it interacts with social institutions, it'll be the courts. You know, people with addictions commit crimes, and they, you know, there's the issues of whether they should, they should be held responsible. And so it was a legal sort of political issue, and addiction was seen, was framed in that way. And there was a movement in the 20th century to say that's completely the wrong way to think about things. Addiction is a medical issue. Addiction is a disease in some sense of the term disease. And we should be thinking in terms of treatment, medical treatment, rather than moral disapprobation or criti- criminal punishment. Right. I think right. that movement has had tremendously important impact on the lives of millions of people. It's been a, a major step forward in our understanding of addiction. And as it's it, one finds in the literature of AA, it's still the sort of official view of most of most physicians who work on addiction. I think it's been very important. My view is that like the next step, as it were, is to move, is that addiction, medicine has a role to play. Addiction is ultimately not a medical issue, nor is it a moral issue. Addicted people are people with certain, who have a certain disability and and it's a a political issue ultimately. But I think, so the medical model did a lot of good, even though I think we're now at a point where we're starting to get ready to maybe move beyond it a bit. Okay. So help me understand a little bit more about that distinction between, uh, you know, disease and disability and the deeper thought process around that. Because I, I think they, they intersect and we use these words, you know, I guess I keep going back to language because language so much informs the thought process and, and how we form meaning. And, you know, they get intertwined and they intersect and it becomes hard to like pull them apart and see the nuance of between these things. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I guess I find it useful to, to get away from words a bit and definitions, like to think of concrete examples. So so I think diabetes is one clear example of a chronic disease. Diabetes, a lot of people, right. a lot of people die from diabetes today. I think it's something like the sep, seventh or eighth leading cause of death in the United yeah. States. It's a really challenging and the disease, if anything's a disease, diabetes is a disease. And if, if one has diabetes, if one's diabetes, progresses to a certain stage, at least one needs kind of constant medical treatment. And I think diabetes is a is a kind of chronic disease. One can compare that to conditions like blindness. So blindness, so being blind is many people think is not a disease. It's a atypical people who are blind have a different visual system or different way of being in the world, not better or worse, just different from people like myself and yourself who are who are sighted. People with blindness are discriminated against, part sometimes explicitly, right. sometimes just implicitly, because most people are not blind. So the society is built for people who are not blind. So there's like the society-wide implicit discrimination. You have diabetes on the one hand, blindness on the other hand. I think addiction is not identical to either one of these. There's no perfect comparison. But I think the tendency in recovery communities and among doctors has been to think of addiction kind of on the model of diabetes. And one sometimes even hears that in recovery communities. My inclination is to push our thinking about addiction away from thinking about it like diabetes and thinking of it a bit more like blindness as a difference that requires, that, that can benefit in some cases from medical treatment, but it's not fundamentally a disease, but it's rather a, a different way of, of being that, as I say, you know, calls for calls for legal protection. Yeah. Right. So a different way of being in the world. So someone who has addiction as part of who they are or in their brain makeup, 
would be a lot like this is just another way of being, another way of existing in the world. And we as a society need to make compensation for that. I don't know if compensation is the right word, but make room for that. Precisely. Accommodation is the word I would use, but otherwise that's that's exactly right. Right. Yeah. Accommodation. That's better. That's that's the word I was looking for. So yeah. <laughs> so help me understand a little bit as as you're doing this and you're and you're putting this out there and, and you're putting this idea out there. What's the pushback against that idea and looking at it that way? Yeah, there's a lot of pushback and I welcome it. I mean, there's because and I think maybe one thing to say kind of stepping back a bit. So when I come and say, you know, people have their theories of addiction, you know, various people have their theories of addiction. They say, this is what addiction is. And here's my arguments for it. When I say addiction is a disability, I think of it as kind of like a proposal that can be accepted or not ultimately by people with addictions themselves. So, so I think ultimately the question, like I think of a disability is in some sense an identity and it's an identity that one has partly in virtue of endorsing that identity. I think blind people say, and you know, in the case of physical disabilities, there's been this 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 incredible disability advocacy and rights movement where where people have said we identify as as having a disability, and that's what that means to us. And so, when I say addiction is a disability, I, it's a suggestion to people with 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 addictions. You know, maybe people with addictions should think of themselves in this way. And the addicted community as a whole, not that there is such a thing really, but there are various parts of it says no thank you we're not we're not interested that's fine with me like that would show that this this proposal had been rejected so when you say pushback it's like this is something that i'm proposing to people with addictions for them to accept or or not reject as they see fit and so as so i wanted to make that clear and then so in terms of pushback there's a fair bit i mean some i mean there's some sort of pushback around issues around choice people will point out you know people generally choose in some sense of choose to become develop an addiction while people don't generally choose in some sense of choice to become blind for example that to me is less is less compelling just because you know some people become blind through their own actions and we but that's not really like morally relevant you know whether someone's right. blind is a it's issue of the downstream rather than the upstream so these issues about responsibility and choice come up a lot i think the other issue i think that i've heard a lot probably this is the number one i've heard of things like i don't like thinking of myself as disabled like i think of myself as a person in recovery you know or however one chooses to identify but the label of this of being disabled feels stigmatizing i think to, to a lot of people I've, I've at least heard that I think part of that is that people have, a, I think disability is stigmatized. I think people in the broader culture have a stigmatized view of blindness, of deafness, of the word disability. Right. When I right. hear that reaction, I'm, my, my thought is like, well, let's not decouple addiction and disability. Let's destigmatize disability. But I think that's the number one thing I've heard. And I take that quite seriously. The people, people in recovery just don't find this label fits them because they have a a view of what that label implies. And that's probably the, the, the single most common piece of pushback I've heard. Yeah, I, I could sense that too and, and understand that kind of pushback against it. Going to another part of it, you know, as you're thinking, at least for me, as I'm thinking about disability, you had mentioned earlier about uh, policy and how our change in our conceptualization of how we think about something can change how we end up responding to it as a society, as individuals. And so can you talk a little bit about that? Definitely. And I think policy is kind of where, as I said earlier, you know, there are these very interesting kind of questions about how one identifies what, you know, the words one uses, but but policy is, is in a way can be more concrete. So I think, so one thing is, is so already, you know, for, you know, roughly well over 20 years, uh, three decades, addiction has been recognized as a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. And that's not generally, I mean, often people don't know that when, when I tell them that if they're not lawyers. So it's like, a, so even people who've been in recovery for 20 years don't realize that they have these legal rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act. They might not want the legal rights, but they, they have them. So people with, people with addictions, have substantial legal rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act and have had in the U.S. for several decades. So that's just like, I think people are kind of unaware of that. And so that's, that's one thing. Is just, that's new information to me as well. I did yeah, not even know yeah. that. 
So in some ways, this is already seen that way under that that piece. Yes. Yeah. And and the U.S. has been quite. Yeah. So this is and the U.S. has been quite progressive in this respect. So in the U.K., for example, there's an explicit statement. You, they have a Disability Act, too, basically. And there says people with addictions are not covered under this act. So it's wow. like a, a, a disputed issue in international law. It's a really like interesting issue in disability law. But the U.S. has been very, you know, has been at the forefront of saying people with addictions are recognized under this law. I think people aren't aware of this. I think people are just beginning to understand the implications of this. So I have a piece out. It came out in Slate magazine earlier. It was like six months ago, roughly, arguing, showing that the ADA can be used. There are a bunch of attorneys working on using the ADA to protect the rights of people. This comes up in the case of people with with opiate addictions, right? kind of safe injection sites, for example. Safe injection sites are often, you know, counties will pass laws being like, no safe injection sites within this neighborhood because X, Y, Z. And these attorneys are saying, well, actually, that's discriminatory under the under the ADA. And these cases, none of this is settled. All these cases are still in the courts. So a lot of this is like is still ongoing. But it, there are quite substantial legal protections that are just now kind of being implemented. Right. So when we start to think of it this way, going back to policy, as you bring these things up, I see how that really can be challenging to how, how we deal with addiction in our culture and put these issues to the forefront. Yes. Yeah, it can be challenging. I think it goes against, I mean, people's a lot of people's views of what addiction is and what the proper way to respond to addiction is. But yeah, it is the law in the U.S. And, and on my view, kind of it's, it's the right law. Like it's like it's, it's a philosophically sort of justified law. Right. I definitely agree with you. I mean, you know, when we look at society and I think we just have a social responsibility to each other to help yeah. each other live our best lives. I mean, that's the society I want to live in and that I try and promote. And so by, you know, I keep going back to language, but because it, it like the way I frame it in my mind and the way I talk about it leads me to different outcomes in my thinking. So by using, you know, disability, I can see how this can shape how we respond to the crisis of addiction in the world, really. I mean, not just the United States, but in the world, you know, it really frames that in a, in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. Like there is an ongoing crisis of addiction. I mean, I guess the part of the view that I haven't really talked about yet is that like, I think on my view, a lot of these, so the, the, the tragic effects of addiction, like all the lives lost, yeah, which is an ongoing tragedy that we can do a lot to prevent. I think that, so on this view, a lot of that is understood in terms of discrimination and exploitation. So there are system, there, there are substances that are designed to extract often money or other things from people with addictions. There are cigarettes, there are online gambling apps, there's hard liquor, there's things like this. So when I say addiction is a disability and addiction should be, you know, protected, I don't mean all those things should be protected. Those to me, uh, people with addictions are a certain set of people who are maybe constitutionally different from other people. And then they're exploited often by the larger society. And I'm quite, I'm a strong advocate for the rights of people with addictions, but a, but also at the same time, an opponent of a lot of the means by which they're, they're exploited. So I don't mean to endorse and uh, endorse all of it, I think. If, if that makes sense, that's that I, on my view is yeah, and and you know having that view is nuanced, and it takes time to really understand and think about these situations, and that all of these situations are unique. So I, I agree with you, and that that takes a lot of thought. It's not simple, and it's not just a, a, an easy black and white answer when we look at how we operate together. One thing that was coming up for me, I was just wondering. You're very passionate about this, and I'm wondering how this started to evolve for you and this thinking and changing your thinking and really starting to say, you know, there's something going on here that needs to be to be looked at. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there are a couple issues. There's, there's one, there's how did I get into the topic of addiction in the first place? So it's, it's, an, it's an issue that I've been passionate about for many reasons. I should say I don't, I don't use alcohol or other substances, and I haven't for several years. I'm still not entirely clear, like, I think, like, how much of my own history to dis disclose in these contexts, and it's a bit, it's something I'm thinking about in the context of the book, right? because I think, I think it's important for people 
to disclose what they can. But I think there's also like I think there's a there's a real expectation that people with addictions should should reveal their their history in a certain way, which I think can often be really helpful. But often, but there's no again. Yeah. I think of the analogy with blind with blindness. I mean, it's it's kind of up to every individual how much they choose or not choose to to disclose. But I'm something. It's something I'm still. I, I've been kind of chatting with friends and trying to work out. But uh, so. Hopefully my book will have my book will have a more a, a clearer answer to this to the to, the, to this to this part of the question. So, but but it's an issue. But it, suffice to say, it's an issue that I'm 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 pretty deeply passionate about and have been for a long time. Well, it's an incredibly in, important issue in our society as a whole to talk about, and also just like what you're saying, having the freedom to I- express or keep private what we need to do and and what's right for us as each individual as we as we go forward so i totally understand that yeah and it's a, it's such a subtle issue because you think of i mean I've, I've been talking as part of this work i've been i've been doing interviews and informally talking to a lot of people with physical disabilities for people with, for example with like dwarfism for example right and other really disabilities where you can't really hide your disabilities so yeah. this issue of well addiction is is, is addiction and other mental disabilities are, are the ones that are the, it's easiest to kind of pass and to sort of not disclose them and that's that's a privilege in a way and it's also and it also complicates kind of what kind of disability exactly addiction is. So these issues about disclosure and privacy feel very important, and I feel like I haven't fully worked them out. Yeah, uh, that myself. makes that makes a lot of sense. And also, you know, I, I think the other thing about this is that there's so much stigma. So this this idea of being able to have these protections if you're in recovery to create a life that's good for you because you have. If you're looking at this from that disability perspective, this is a part of you to be able to operate in this life is is you you need these accommodations, as we said earlier. And, you know, being able to to do that, because I'm also thinking about people who are, you know, struggling in this, they need support, they need help, they need certain, like I said, accommodations to be successful in their life. And because of the stigma, some yeah. some of those things are are taken away or not given or denied or minimized. And so it makes it even harder for someone who's struggling with this to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. hundred percent. And, and so I think this is such an important conversation to have because we need to talk about this in, in different ways. Yeah. Totally agree. Okay. So as we keep going, I want to take a little bit deeper. How is this view compatible with, you know, when we we look at the medical view, right, and look at the current research around the neuroscience of addiction? Tell me a little bit more about that and how those things interplay. And Yeah. And there's, I mean, on my view, they're fully compatible. I mean, again, I'll often do this move of, and this is just how I think about it when I'm trying to work out these questions, I'll think about physical disabilities. I'm like, well, how does the neuroscience of vision bear on our, tre- you know, on blindness? And it probably has lots of impacts. It probably has lots of interesting impacts on treatments for vision and stuff like that. And so all the better that people are working on the neuroscience of vision. But that doesn't really affect the fact, in some sense, that blindness is a disability, that people with who are blind, it's fully their choice what medical interventions they do or don't accept. So I kind of tend to think the same way about addiction. People are working out the neuroscience. That's great. I think we should work out the neuroscience of everything. But it but it has no special claim, I guess I, I should say. There's the, there's sometimes this thought that neuroscience is somehow, you know, definitive in the case of in the case of addiction. You'll sometimes in recovery communities people will be like, oh, there's been an article showing that we've discovered the gene for for this or the neuron that does that, and this is supposed to be this is supposed right. to be a discovery. I guess I'm skeptical of those sorts of implications. I think. Neuroscience is interesting, you know, physical science is interesting. It's all it's all interesting, but the idea that that addiction is like a neuro, neuro addiction on my view is no more a neuroscientific topic than is blindness or deafness. Blindness and deafness also involve the brain, but they're not the province of neuroscience. So the more the merrier with neuroscience, but it has no special claim or authority with respect to addiction. Right. That it, this is it just it's almost like addiction just is. It's it's there, it's present, it's part of who someone may be and it's yeah well it's but i don't want to sound like a nihilist about treatment like for example medications for opioid use disorder like suboxone i think these are miraculous i think they save a lot of lives i think if people i do want to 
urge that, you know, it's up to individuals whether or not they use those substances. Some people in recovery communities have certain feelings about those substances. So that's all up for debate. But I welcome medical interventions that can save the lives of people with addictions. I just want to urge that we think of those as accommodations, as things that are there for addicted people if they want them rather than as cures or anything like that. Right. If if they need them and, and they, they help them. What about like when you look at like recovery from addiction? For for a lot of people, they may go through an episode of addiction and get in long term recovery. And a, the addictive part, I would say, isn't always necessarily a big part of their life anymore. And h- how does that work in this model too? Because you know now would it still be seen as, as someone disabled and? Yeah, definitely. I think this is a nice feature of the of the disability view. So if you look at sort of certain like what you get in the DSM, the standard kind of psychiatric manual, where it'll talk about, for example, an alcohol use disorder as having certain patterns of use around alcohol. And if those haven't been present for a certain number of years, you no longer have an alcohol use disorder and you're just you no longer qualify. The disability model is much more identity driven than it is behavior driven. And, and that's in a way, I think, consonant with things that you're in the recovery community. So someone can have an addiction and use a lot and then stop using and maybe stop using for decades and yet still identify as, you know, what, as having an alcohol addiction, as being an alcoholic, um, as having a drug addiction, as being an addict, whatever terms they choose to, they choose to use. I think it's a nice thing about the disability model that it vindicates that sort of thing. That sort of thing. A disability. It's, it's the sort of this is this is who I am. I'm a person who basically has this sort of constitution. I'm not actively using substances right now, but it's who I am. I identify as having an alcohol addiction or having a drug addiction, and so I think the identity-driven nature of the disability model can capture this this sort of quite plausible remark that people can remain can continue to have an addiction decades after they stop actively using. Right. And it also gives people the ability to change that if if they don't identify that way anymore. Yeah. They don't have to yeah. identify that way. And exactly. And they can they can be you know, I'm also thinking I'm thinking of the practical side of this, like thinking of it this way and how that would operate in, in our society and changing this kind of viewpoint. And the ability that if if someone doesn't identify that way, but maybe later in their life, uh, another episode comes up in their life where addiction starts to to come back, they can have the accommodations made to to be able to get support and help in a in a compassionate, kind way, and then totally, yeah. and then operate in in society and be productive instead of the other route where you know there's a lot of stigma. And even like thinking about it from a medical perspective, you know, kind of being, I guess, put into that medical category. Once again, you're back into that behavioral definition that is is kind of limiting and they get kind of stuck there again. Yeah. And and not the the way I'm thinking of it is not, you know, I'm thinking of people operating in their life. And the looking at it as a disability allows me to see it that way. How does someone function instead of just here? Okay, we have treatment. Here's the medical thing you need to do. But that it's it's a I don't know like a life stance, a a, a, a yeah, way in yeah. which we operate in the world that we can function in. And here's the accommodations in your current life to be able to yeah live your best life. Yeah, uh, yeah, I like the idea of a life stance. Yeah, it's not. I mean, and which is something that the disease model feels like it doesn't fully, fully capture. And 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 yeah. if you look at you know the recovery literature, I think it, you know some of it's very disease model heavy, but some of it has this different idea of like this is a way of being. This is kind of who I am, and this is a central piece of my identity. And I think the disability model gives it captures that, and also captures, as you said, some people use alcohol or use some other drug heavily for a few years and then stop using. And go on with their lives and don't really identify as as having addictions, and that's okay too. That's up to them too. Like one can go either way, and it's really the individual who makes that final call. It really kind of speaks to me about passionate care. Yeah, because you know when I when I look at that, it's it's like 
working in the in the field of mental health, you're looking to support people that that need some support in some way and some help and giving them that instead of going back to the stigma which which isolates people which keeps them alone keeps them without some of the support it kind of promotes a, a way of uplifting uplifting yep i think all that's great I, compassion is is a, i mean I, I i think of it almost in terms of of rights like it's like we're really when we're supporting people with addictions we're doing we're giving them things they're entitled to whether so it's not so compassion on this view is is not the is not the central is not yeah, the central virtue I can see yeah that. yeah it's sort of like uh, i don't know i don't have a good word for it but it's something it's just like you know I think compassion's good. I'm all in favor of compassion, of course. But that's not. But I understand not that's not the main to... point of it. Like it, it, this is just a right you should you should have, and yeah. it's not. It's regardless of it, compassion or anything. But I, I guess it it just makes them more compassionate. Like when we do that, we are a more compassionate yeah. society. If that makes sense, when we yeah, respect that's... that peace that these are our rights, then it, I think it creates a more compassionate world. I, I, that's a good way of putting it. People are people deserve their rights, but when we as a society recognize people's rights and and, and then we as a society are are showing our compassion, our moral progress. I mean, and, and all yeah. this is a piece of moral progress of slowly understanding. You know, going back to your first question, like things that we once held to be moral deficiencies are actually just different ways of being. And these are you know people with addictions are just fellow citizens who are entitled to their rights, and and so we're recognizing that now finally. Yeah, and I I think that's a progress we make as we are willing to have these kind of conversations to figure it out, to be able to talk about it and really expand our view of of thinking and looking at it from different perspectives and different ideas. I think helps us create that. So, John, I want I, it's it has been a pleasure to have this conversation with you. I think we could dig in it even more. I look forward to your, your book on it. Do you have an idea when that's going to be done or? Yes, it, it's roughly, it'll, it's, it's kind of the, the manuscript exists and sort of, I'm revising it now. And so it'll probably submit it later this year and probably be, uh, you know, early, early 2024 is what we're looking at for a publication date. And it's with Rufflage, I should say. Oh, awesome. So, so it should be early, early next year. Would so I be able to so. get a copy of that? I would love to be able to read it. That, well, when it's when it's yeah you, when, when, it's, when it's when it's ready, yeah, and have you yeah, and yeah, have you course. come yeah, back yeah. on? Oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, that would yeah that would you be know awesome. to to discuss it and and really dig in, especially after I could read it because I think it's such an important topic to to talk about and to think about as we learn how best to help everyone, especially you know when we're talking about addiction and the pain and suffering that comes with that and how we can help alleviate that in, in our, in our world. That would be great. All right. So th this is a one question. I don't know, because our, our conversation is about this very um, succinct topic, but I always like to ask one question when to my guests before we end. And that's like, if someone out there is listening to this conversation and maybe they're resonating with it or, or, or something is important about it, you could tell them one thing. What would you want to say? I think that's going to be a hard thing to answer. Oh wow, well, yeah, that's. I mean, <laughs> what would you want them to know? I, in a way, it's just this. I mean, it's it's kind of what what I like. I think the simplest thing is just it's just the simple legal fact that hey, addiction is a disability, and you've got you've got lots of rights if you want to use them. And just I think just informing people of that. But but I, but I said to be this is the, the you know the and I think especially for people who I mean I, I'm thinking about people who are you know I'm sure a lot of people in like early recovery listen to this podcast. So I think it would be like, you know, take this or leave this. Like if, if this is, if this is helpful to you, awesome. If it's not helpful to you, just disregard it. You're probably right. And so I'd, I'd really, and that's the spirit of this view. Obviously the spirit of this view is that it's a proposal that I have that people should, should accept or not accept as they, as they find it, as they find it useful. Yeah, definitely. I love that. Take take what works and 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 yeah, yeah. and look at it and be open it. But I I love that you're opening the dialogue and you're challenging us to think differently and to get more information and new information. You know, with with new information, new thinking, new possibilities come. So I think that's that's uh, very awesome. So where can people find you? 
Yeah, definitely. Probably the easiest way. So my website is just www.jmeyer, that's J-M-A-I-E-R, dot net. And that has like my publications, but also has a little contact page with like my email and my Twitter. So I really mean it that I'm like actively working on these things. And I can never hear enough from people who are interested in these topics, especially people's, you know, own people's own perspectives. I really welcome that. So please reach out by email or Twitter. All the contact information is on my website. I'd really that would really be helpful for me. I'd, I'd really appreciate that. Awesome. Well, thank you for all the work that you're doing and your willingness to get all that information and, and to put these viewpoints out there. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for coming on to The Addicted Mind. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Dwayne. All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to The Addicted Mind podcast. As usual, all the show notes will be at theaddictedmind.com. So check that out. If you've enjoyed this episode, maybe share it with a friend. And don't forget, click the subscribe button so you can get the latest episodes in your feed. So I hope you are having a wonderful day or will have a wonderful day. And I will talk to you on the next episode.